Auto Podcast, we are ecstatic to announce that we've teamed up with our boy Todd Abrams and his company Icon Meals. Bah, 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 bah. There you go, good air horn. <laughs> Uh, in case you guys ain't knowing, uh, Icon Meals is a food prep service company that will ship directly to your door. Oh, man. They got some really good stuff. And now they're adding some keto stuff to their lineup. They got some salmon. They got some burgers. My favorite thing to eat is they just have like a they just have like a bacon cheeseburger. That's yeah. my favorite thing. Mm-hmm. I just throw that thing in the microwave for three or four minutes. You know, I, I try my best to have like my food always like ready to like cook and stuff. But mm-hmm. Sometimes you just mess up. You forget to thaw something out or whatever. These hang out in my freezer. They're ready to rock, and it just takes about four minutes, throw them in the microwave, and they're ready to go. Yeah, especially if you're super busy. Like, I have a ton of clients that are super busy. They work in an office all day. Yeah, they try to cook, but it's not always feasible because of kids, et cetera. So Icon Meals and, like, these meal prep companies are something that I always suggest because the meals, first off, especially from Icon, taste amazing. You can warm it up real quick. And it's just great for on the go. The other thing I like is the family aspect of it. When I order from them and have ordered in the past, you know, I'll get my kids. They have like a brisket quesadilla. They got That's a bunch of stuff. Mm. It's kind of hard to trick your kids into like eating things that are healthy, but there's a lot more protein in most of the stuff that they have. And even like the peanut butter and jelly, I think it has like 41 grams of protein or something <laughs> crazy like that. Yeah. Yeah, you guys need to head over to iconmeals.com right now, create your own custom meal plan, or order off of the weekly meals at checkout. Enter promo code POWERPROJECT for 10% off your entire order. Yeah, so I think a bavette steak, for people that don't know, I think it might be a little bit similar to a flat iron steak, Mm -hmm. but the bavette steak, man, that thing is really, really tender. So what I did the other day with it is I just, and I showed it on my Instagram, so make sure you guys check it out so you can learn how to cook it, but I just chopped it up with some scissors. I threw it on my, uh, my grill and, or griddle rather. And it cooked up in like, I think about three minutes. Whoa. It cooked up super fast. It was 16 ounces of meat, 16 (laughs) grams of fat, one gram of fat per ounce. And it was 100 grams of protein. (laughs) Country (laughs) grammar. Wow. A hundred grams of protein. That's incredible. That's why I look so jacked today. Yeah. So it's not the steroids, it's the beef. But isn't it kind of like almost blasphemy to cut it with scissors and, you know, I know, I think people get all worried about the way that you cut up, you know, the way you cut your meat and the way that you cook it and stuff. But I actually been using scissors for a while and it, if you, if you cook it before you cut it, you get the luxury of having the meat like right away because mm-hmm. it cooks so fast. Mm. Um, and I know some people are like, oh, you know, it's going to be more tender. It's going to be more juicy when you cook it this other way. Um, but it's just a different experience cutting it this way. The other thing I learned is that sometimes with like a grass fed meat, which certified Piedmontese has a lot of grass fed grass finished meat as well. Uh, sometimes there's going to be some parts that are kind of tough. And what we know from like Paul Saladino and Dr. Baker, like those guys want you to commit. They want you to eat the whole thing, Mm -hmm. right? They want you to eat even some of the weird wiry parts. But when you cut it up a certain way, you get to eat all that stuff without it being like weird or stringy or any of that stuff. So it works out really good. I love it. Yeah. Certified Piedmontese, the absolute best beef on the planet. Head over to Piedmontese.com. That's P-I-E-D-M-O-N-T-E-S-E.com. At checkout, enter promo code POWERPROJECT for 25% off your order. And if your order is $99 or more, you get free two-day shipping. You believe that? 100 grams of protein? And 16 grams of fat. I, it doesn't look like you're in belief, man. <laughs> it still it shocks like me. It still you're does shocked. shock me. But it's true. 100 grams. <laughs> wow. <laughs> His pants are going to come off again. Just what are we that's gonna be halfway. What are you talking about? Anyways, let's just get back to this podcast. I don't yeah. know what Jessica's over here spewing about. Yeah, everybody listen to daddy over there. Mm-hmm. Why'd you call me daddy, weirdo? <laughs> See what I mean about these two? Very frisky. I, this was highly flirtatious. They were yeah. after each other big time. That's, mm. what, I, that's what I think's going on, but I don't know. <laughs> just all kind of speculation. Hey, I got a question about acting because I, I sometimes wonder, like when you when you shoot a scene and it's funny, or even if something just strikes you funny, maybe the scene's not that funny. How the hell do you make it through it when you start getting giggly and start getting silly? Because like, you know, sometimes once you get uh, the giggles like that, you can't stop. How do you? How, do you have to walk off set sometimes and yes, regroup. Sometimes you do have to walk off and regroup, and sometimes um they will have you they'll notice like if you and i are doing it and you and i are making each other laugh they'll be like okay you fuck off (laughs) it's like in school you gotta be separated yeah now say it to like we're gonna draw an x on the camera 
or with tape. It gets that bad sometimes, huh? Yeah. yeah, it gets bad. Damn. That's pretty cool. I always wanted to know that because I was like, how do they How do they sometimes get through this stuff? You know, sometimes on like Saturday Night Live, they might just kind of play through it and yeah. it's, it's live and they laugh and then it makes everyone else laugh and it actually makes the skit kind of funnier. But I love it when they break on Saturday yeah. Night Live. It's my, some of my favorite parts where you start to see them laugh. Yeah. <laughs> like one guy's just laughing. He can't do it anymore. That's fantastic. So we just talked to you about your weight loss journey and, you know, being, you know, uh, 550 pounds or whatever you weighed at the top you're not really sure uh and you got all the way down to 220 and then you found a happy medium where you're uh a little happier with your current body weight but you still have a lot of goals and stuff and you want to get abs and things like that yeah but for this show i'd love to really uh talk about um you know the difficulties of growing up being heavy and i think you mentioned to me uh that you were around 10 years old when you were 200 pounds some of the information that we have here says uh, you kind of recall being put on a diet at a very young age. And um, all this is very hard stuff to talk about. And um, I know a lot of uh, a lot of people have, you know, maybe kids in their family that struggle or uh, maybe they are young themselves and they're struggling. And um, there's just so much that's tied into all this. And when you watch uh, uh, Biggest Loser or a show like that, you're kind of sometimes like people that have never been in those shoes before. Um, they may not understand, like, why are these people crying? Why don't they just eat less and move around more, right? Like, if they don't maybe don't have a lot of compassion towards it because they might not understand it. So I think it's great to have a resource of somebody that's been through it. Um, what, what are some of your early recollections of being maybe uh, a little different than the other kids? It, w- when I was five, I <clears throat> went and stayed with my grandparents and, and they lived in Vermont and it was like a summer thing where I was just going to spend some time with them for the summer. And at that point, I don't think I'd ever had any perception that I was different than the other kids. I didn't think of myself as fat or overweight or anything like that. And they... I had to, they had, they, they, I remember their reaction when they saw me was like shock. Like Maybe they didn't see you for a while. Yeah. They hadn't seen me for a year or something like that. They saw me, they were in shock. They had me take my clothes off and get on a scale and they were just, there was so much. And by the way, my being overweight at five when I look at pictures, I see myself as looking total. I'm like, that's a normal looking kid. I, well, you know, compared to what I became, I wasn't I'm just an American kid that maybe enjoyed food a little bit. Right. I wasn't uh, spilling out of my clothes at yeah. five. Um, and then there was a very deliberate um, intent that they were openly talking to me about restricting my food um and you know my grandfather my favorite meal to this day that that i have such fond memories of are my grandfather's lasagna and they made this lasagna the day i arrived and then gave me a little piece of it and said that's it you can't have any more and i remember the first time i ever snuck food was in their kitchen getting another serving of this lasagna and eating it really quickly. And I I think that's where kind of it began for me. Now, my parents were super into health food and we were always kind of on something, but it wasn't, they weren't talking to me like you have to lose weight. My dad did say, if you get to be 200 pounds, I'm putting you on a diet. And at 10, I was 200 pounds. And that, and then I did, I think it was called OptiFast at the time. Maybe there's some version of it now called SlimFast. Mm. Kind of like a liquid, yeah, basically liquid diet. And I didn't hate doing that, but I, I didn't do it for very long. And my mom was like, this can't be healthy. We're not going to do this. And I remember going, but, but it's working. Every time I go into this place... I'm less weight, so yeah, why lose, stop? Yeah, losing weight and uh, being a child, they don't sound like they go together. Right. Like, like, I think most people would think, no, that's wrong. Your kid shouldn't be, your kid shouldn't even want to lose 10 pounds. But if they're really heavy, I don't know where else you would go. Yeah. And the the first memories I have of 
like feeling so it was five where, where i had suddenly uh some kind of uh introversion about my body and and how i looked and i was like oh suddenly there's going to be a lot of control and things i don't want um but i also remember the first time like outside of my grandparents feeling uncomfortable was being 10 and you know whatever i guess that's like elementary school walking by the preschool kids who have no filter and who are all kind of like what's wrong with him or look at him you know that so i would avoid preschool little kids because they they don't hold back you know but um so that's those are my first memories of being fat and were your grandparents just uh well-meaning people were they mean people or what what do you think i i, I think they were well-meaning i think they looked at me and saw something that they didn't think was right and they were trying to correct it in the way that they knew how to correct it um they weren't mean i, I mean i i didn't like having my food restricted um but i don't think it was like an abusive You're like thing. i'm not going there again <laughs> spend right. time with them again yeah no but and then i and, and then i and then i would wind up going there again and 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 it was always a thing mm. yeah when you were growing up like I don't know, like, did you have access to these foods all the time? Like, were they in the house and you had access to it? Or did you have to, like, did, did you go out and get it somewhere else? Like, how did that work in the house? In, in, well, like, there, there wasn't a lot of, like, sugar and stuff in my house as a kid because my mom was super into, like, health food. Yeah. Like, the, the, the most hippie, granola y, version of a whole foods would be what we were buying then it was prior to whole foods existing but there were little health food stores mm -hmm. that we would shop and so we our cereal tasted like crap and was like not sugary um but i would just eat to eat much more than i needed to eat and i would you know when people weren't looking i would eat more and if i was told to clear the table i would eat food off of somebody else's plate and stuff like that okay yeah as a young kid for me and something that's still hard for me to like overcome is you know i just always had a habit when i was done with dinner i always wanted to eat more yeah i don't know why because it's like i just ate you know it's a, it's almost like it's almost like uh, when you wake up in the morning there's people that are like i need to have a cup of coffee You're like you just slept you slept for like eight hours like that's not enough like right. why do you need a cup of coffee and I think sometimes these thoughts that we have are they're kind of irrational, but they're hard to control. And if you're not aware of them, then you end you you end up you know gaining weight because you're just like you know I, I think for me I think a lot of what happens even today when I have a meal I always kind of like want the opposite. You know I have something kind of salty and something kind of savory, especially because I don't eat a lot of carbohydrates. And I'm like thinking about man, it'd be great to get something sweet to kind of yeah. finish things off. You know? Yeah. Yeah, and that's not like a, a big person thing. Like my daughter, she's in amazing shape and she's 11, but she'll do the same thing too. Like we'll have dinner and she'll like kind of poke through the fridge and like, hey, like, what are you doing? Are you still hungry? It's like, well, I want something sweet now. So it's, I think you're right, Mark. It's just the opposite of whatever we just had, you know, is kind of what our body's like. Hey, you should probably go tackle some of that now. You're right. Yeah, I think it's a real problem with availability, you know, that if something is available to us, I, I and and I don't know if this is universally true, but for me, whatever was available, I would consume it, even if it wasn't my favorite food. I was eating everything on my plate, mm -hmm. and then maybe some more. You know what I mean? I wasn't, I wasn't eating. I there was no like, I'm gonna eat until I feel like I'm not hungry, and once I feel like I'm not hungry, I'm done. That didn't happen. It was just what's here. I'm gonna consume it. When you were in school, were you the biggest person? Yeah, by and a then, lot. And uh, by a lot. And what was that? I mean, what was that? That must have been difficult. What was that like? It there, when I was a kid, I I don't think that there was uh a, there were not a lot of other obese kids. So, um, it was just me, um, in my school, and and I remember not um. 
seeing kids that looked like me wherever I went. Um, so I, you know, I always just kind of thought that this was a, a unique thing to me. You know what I mean? It wasn't, it, it, I, it, I had no idea that, and, and, you know, I knew other kids weren't eating as much as me, but I wasn't, I wasn't thinking in those terms. You know, I don't think as a kid, we're often thinking through stuff as we're just kind of operating on impulses sometimes. Mm -hmm. I also think as a kid, like you just want to kind of, uh, you want to kind of blend in, yeah. right? You know, that's, that's kind of the hope for a lot of kids. They just don't want to be doing something weird or look a certain way. They just don't want to like end up kind of sticking out like a sore thumb and, and, uh, and look different from the pack. Did you get teased a lot? Did you get made fun of a lot? Not, not, I mean, you're a pretty big person in general. So. Yeah. No, I, 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 I it, there were a, f a handful of times if somebody said something, if somebody called me fat or something like that, we would just have a fight. Yeah. And so kids didn't do that very much because I would just get mad and fight them. Um, that, so there, there, there are only a, a, a few times in my life where I, can remember that happening you know i i i and i just would get into a fight with somebody about it did like the early exposure to dieting when you were 10 did that shit like i guess did it change the way you looked at dieting and weight loss as you were getting older did it make you in the back of your head any resistant have any resistance to it or not really <clears throat> No, I think there was a huge period of my life. I think it, it, I, I went way off the rails when I got a car and I had some freedom. And suddenly it wasn't just the food that was in my house, which I was still overeating. Mm -hmm. It was now I can have the food in my house and I can also go eat fast food, which was not something we did a lot of as a kid. Um, and you know, with the drive through, you only have that kind of moment of maybe this person is judging me that lasts like a minute. They, they take your money and they give you the food and then you drive away really quickly. So the, the idea of going into a fast food restaurant and ordering what I would want to order and sitting in there and eating it, that was never going to happen. I would rather have this one uncomfortable moment where they could see me in my car we could have the transaction and then I'd even just go pull into the parking lot and sit and eat it. I still feel super guilty doing stuff like that. Even when, if I'm just like uh, feeling like just eating whatever, you know, I go to the grocery store and you start loading up on some candy and ice cream and people are like, what the fuck's going on over here? Totally. Like you're, you feel like you're being judged and you maybe rightfully so <laughs> maybe people are kind of like, Hey man, that's a lot of food. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know. I p putting rice in my cart, buying bread. I'm always like, are people looking? You know, yeah. like this is, I still An have, alarm goes off. Yeah. I have years of thinking this stuff is like going to make you fat. And here's a fat guy buying a big bag of 20 pound bag of rice. And it's mm -hmm. like, ah, uh. you know, I wonder what that kind of paradox is, is because like, you know, a lot of parents, when they're raising their kids, they keep them away from like a lot of sodas and sugary foods. And you said your mom was health conscious yeah. and my mom too. She was super health conscious. I never had soda, didn't eat much fast food. But eat, once I got the freedom to go and like have that stuff, there was a period of time where I just ate a fuck ton of it. And yeah. I, could, I couldn't control myself because it wasn't something I was allowed as a kid. So I'm trying to wonder like, what, what should you do or how should you help kids out in that realm? Like, do you think it, it, you would have been better off if you were educated? Like, did your mom try to educate you about food or did she just give you this and tell you not to eat that? I don't think I ever got an education in what the use of protein is in the body, what mm -hmm. the use of carbs are, what the use of fat is and what the use of fiber is, and then whatever micronutrients you need. I, I, my mom, you know, if we got sick, she'd hand me a handful of vitamins, which I think only discolored my pee. That's all I got out of that. You yeah. know what I mean? There was no, there was no, I don't remember, you know, physical education or health class, I don't remember ever talking about those things. I remember the food pyramid, mm -hmm. but it was basically just you need you need to eat these things in these ratios, but they're not even that well defined. Yeah, 
they talk about it in just a super general terms. And they do talk about calories and protein and stuff. They don't really uh, give you any details on actionable items that you could potentially utilize to be healthier, really. N- none at all. <clears throat> I, I didn't know any of that. I, I knew periodically we would have this aha moment collectively in Los Angeles of this is the culprit. We're all going to kind of like the health conscious people are all going to generally stop consuming this. Mm -hmm. And, and then nothing would change for me. You know what I mean? I I would be the guy who wouldn't, his mom would not allow nightshades or saturated fat or, you know, egg yolks are bad. And then suddenly egg yolks are good. And we're adding egg yolks to our omelet. And, And like, it's so confusing rather than here's what your body does with protein here's what your body does with carbohydrates here's what your body does with fats here's the way your body deals with excess calories here's how your body deals with a caloric deficit like that for me would have been a valuable health lesson or a valuable physical education like physical education i don't remember being actually educated on anything it was just like run laps You're going to move and you're going to have a kind of a not nice guy yelling at you and telling you you're not working hard enough. Like, why are we doing this? Where's the actual education? Yeah, I get you can be training your body and that worked for some kids. That did not work for me. And does anybody even know how to run? You know, it's like, did you even shit? Like running is kind of like an innate thing. Like we know how to run, like skip, jump. Like there's certain things you kind of know how to do, but someone can teach you a more efficient way of doing it. And they can say, hey, like, this is a this is a better way to run. And uh, the reason why it's good to learn a better way to run is so we don't hurt ourselves. And the reason why running is good is because it can be very healthy. It can help you burn calories. And if you make a habit of running or swimming or any of these activities that we show you, uh, these could be options. The more options you have, the kind of you, you could ride your bike, you could lift some weights. The more options you have, the more likely you are to probably stay active and to keep moving throughout. It'd be great if you could move uh, from now until, you know, the day the day you pass on. Yeah. You know? Like yeah. Sh- the options are key because we're not all the same. So if, if, if there's something I like to do that you don't and we're supposed to spend some time actually moving our bodies around, why should we be doing the same thing that maybe neither of us like to do? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I never liked running laps. I never did run laps. I would walk very slowly and get yelled at. But, like, why was that my phys- – that, that, that to me is not a good physical education. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? When I talk to my kids now, we talk about how enhance how, – how the body does better when you move it more. You know what I mean? And, like, let's figure out stuff to do. Okay, you want to make TikTok videos as your form, you know, as your form of exercise for that? That's perfectly fine. You can dance for two hours if you want to. You're moving. That's great. You know, somebody's going to like something. And how, how do you uh, explain uh, nutrition to your kids? Is there, uh, is it like a lead by example type of deal? Um, or did, have they asked you questions over the years? How have you handled that? It It, it is. I, my, kids who are older and in college we have much 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 more detailed conversations about how the body works with all this stuff the younger kids it is kind of a lead by example but also having come from a a basically a dry household as a kid um and then having the problems i had with drugs and really feeling like i was not able to talk to my parents about it um though though i'm sure and i know that they were like please talk to us. We're not going to, it's not going to be a problem. Just talk to us. I just didn't feel comfortable. I'm trying to create an environment in our house where there's nothing off limits as long as you talk to us about it. You know what I mean? If I get a call from one of my kids saying I'm at a party and everyone's drunk and I don't know how to get home, they're not going to be in trouble because they told me about it. Now, if they get in a car with a drunk person, somebody's going to get their head torn off, you know, verbally. Yeah. yeah. So, like, you're just trying to keep as, like, uh, the communication as open as possible, keep the dialogue open so they can feel like they can come with you with anything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and on their terms. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. You know, with, with my children, um, you know, my son, you know, he's uh, 
he's going to be, he's 16. And, you know, with him, he's asked questions about, you know, drugs before. And rather than being like, drugs are bad, you know, rather than jumping down his throat, you know, he would, he would ask it in today's, you know, in, from, from a lot of stuff going on today, uh, people talk pretty openly about, um, psychedelics and stuff like that. Joe Rogan and people like that. Right. And so those were some of his questions. And he's like, oh, I heard it can enhance this. I heard it can do that. And I said, well, absolutely. I said, oh, there's a lot of, there's, I said, some of the greatest music, some of the greatest art, some of the greatest uh, screenplays, some of the, some uh, really amazing things have come out of people being high. Sure. <laughs> and they've come out of people being drunk. Uh, but I said, a lot of those things um, can, can spiral out of control where you're no longer in control. And they can also cause a lot of problems. I said, you know, you lost, I said, I lost my uncle to it. You lost your uncle to it. You almost lost another uncle to it. Um, there's a lot of drug and alcohol addiction in the family. And so it's just something that you should always know that, uh, you know, I, I'm kind of a believer that it sort of does run in the family. And so if you ever think about doing any of those things, you should be very cautious. You should be really paying attention. And, you know, then he just, it just started up more conversation. We just started talking about other stuff and he was like, you know, I don't really think I'm even that interested in it, but he, he just, he just said, I think it's really neat that it can expand your mind and stuff like that. He's like, I think it's kind of cool. You know? Yeah. I think it's important to be able to talk. I think the minute, especially with kids that we just build a wall and say, this whole subject is taboo. We shouldn't talk about it. It's just bad. I know for me as a kid, that would just make me more interested in that. Yeah. And, and so I, I want to do anything but that. So really stuff like that is like, it's all kind of fair game in, in our house. We just want to be able to talk about it. Because you had like, like a bad experience with like drugs and alcohol, when your kids, maybe when they did come to you with that type of stuff, how do you approach that with them? Do you tell them about your past and what you've dealt with? They're like, yeah, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, there's some things where I would say like, look, there are some drugs that really are not good for you that I can't, I've never heard a sane argument for. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm totally, I can, I've heard great arguments for legalizing them, but I've not heard great arguments for taking them. The rates of addiction are super high. So I've had those conversations with my kids, but then also, I mean, I have kids in college who we've had conversations about certain drugs that I very openly cannot participate in. Yeah. And I'm like, let's talk about your experience with those. What was it like? Now, if I start to see your grades slipping, maybe we have to have another conversation, but, and I don't even have to say that. Mm -hmm. I'm just like aware of this. And by the way, I'm playing it super cool with them. Meanwhile, I'm terrified and going like, I hope what I'm doing is right. It has been so far. We haven't had any big problems, but We've had, we've gone through that and like, you know, thankfully I, I haven't seen that kind of like uh, propensity for addiction in my kids that I have, but my, my wife is also very temperate. Um, so I'm hoping that more of her is rubbing off on them than me. Yeah. She might be uh, maybe m more aggressive or more to the point. Uh, with some of those things? She, yeah, I think she just comes from more of a place of certainty and 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 we're we've kind of made this decision to allow our kids, you know, we're not going to uh, criminalize anything within our household. Um, but her and I have had conversations where it's like, look, if we start to see a problem, clearly we're going to have to step mm -hmm. in and say this is a problem that hasn't happened. You know, with my kids too, I've been sharing with them from, since they've been very young about, I started out by just saying, Hey, look, you know, if, if you continue to eat that, if you continue to eat some of these foods, like I just flat out told them it's not good. I just flat out would say they're bad. I would flat out tell them that it makes them fat because kids understand like black and white, you know, that's not very healthy for you. That's not a great option. Um, I would say things like, um, you already had a soda today, you know, like, let's try to balance this out and make sure we're not, you know, eating too much. Like they've known from a very young age and now they're, they're older now. So I don't say any of that stuff. They're teenagers. Like it, it just would, wouldn't be appropriate, but they know from when they were younger, all the stuff that I've been teaching them along the way. And I have said, like, they'll ask questions. They'll say, Hey, does this make me fat? And I'll, I'll say, Hey, let's back up a second. Let's talk about that. And, and let's make some sense of it. 
<clears throat> and I'll say nothing really makes you fat except for yourself, except for like overeating. The food, you know, the ice cream that you have, there's a lot of potential to overeat that ice cream. There's a lot of potential to overeat your calories for the day and have that end up being body fat. But ice cream's fucking awesome. You yeah. know, let's enjoy the ice cream and not uh, really sweat it too much. But we don't want to have a lot of influence of processed foods every day. And what I do share with them is I say, I hope that you don't ever have to really be on a diet because if you don't eat fried food, you don't eat fast food, you don't eat a lot of desserts, and you don't eat a lot of processed foods, you you don't really need... <laughs> And you eat, you know, you eat an adequate amount of protein. You're going to be okay. That's your plan. Like, that's it. You yeah. don't have to. And of course, yeah, we need some movement. But like those, that's like four or five rules. It's not that bad. Yeah. That's not that hard to follow. And right. especially if you do it your whole life, you never accumulated a lot of body fat. So now you're not up against it and you have to always figure out the next latest, greatest diet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I made the mistake with my littlest kids from the time they were babies, basically, when we'd drive around and we'd see McDonald's or something like that, I'd say, we don't eat that, that's poison. Mm. <laughs> and I said this to them over and over, and at some point we were on a ski trip, and you know, you got kids, and the, the lines for food are insane, and so I'm like, I'm gonna take the little kids, well, I'm not gonna deal with this craziness, so we're gonna go find something, drive around, restaurants are full, I see a McDonald's, and I'm like, the, the kids are about to turn into gremlins. I got to get something in them. <laughs> and we pull in and they're sitting in the back of this car and one of them starts crying. And I'm like, what is going on with you? And she said, you're going to poison us. <laughs> That's crazy. And so I think they're, ha and, and this was just me going like, I'm going to try, I'm going to try to lead them away from this. Meanwhile, McDonald's has fantastic French fries. You know, the chicken <laughs> McNuggets are delicious. Like, yeah, and it also has options where the calories don't have to be that crazy. Right. You get, I think, like a egg McMuffin or something like that. It's, I don't, I don't know. It's like under three hundred calories. Yeah. I think. I think it's fairly reasonable. Now, if you get the hash browns and a giant orange juice with it, maybe you're running into some problems. But it, they do have options there that aren't too crazy. Yeah, I, I think I had gone to an extreme that I shouldn't have gone to. You, you, you know what I mean? I think yeah. there there can be a path where it's like, if you learn to make good decisions, I, I think your protein thing is really, really valid. As long as you're, if you fr front load the protein, you're not gonna be as hungry for other stuff. Your body's gonna be nourished. Like that's really smart. Um, you know, and, and, and as long as we're not being completely insane on something where like all the food we're eating is fast food or none of the food we're eating, we pretending like I was that it's truly poison, which I think that if you're getting a hundred percent of your calories from McDonald's, you're doing it wrong. Like, <laughs> I don't think that's healthy, but I think there has to be, I don't think it's actually poison, you know? Yeah. And trying to have, um, good options for your children uh, is hugely important you know rather than buying some weird bastardized version of cereal just don't have cereal right. just you know explain like hey look if you you know want something in the morning that represents cereal you can have some oatmeal with some uh, brown sugar and some butter in it but let's not we're just not even going to buy cereal it's not it's not an option but you can have potatoes you can have fruit you can have uh, cottage cheese you can have milk you can i mean there's so many good healthy kind of natural options that you can eat to the point where you don't really need a lot of those other i realize that the, i realize that there's like snack foods there's like cheese it's and things like that but the, you know the, kind of the honest truth on some of those things you don't really need them for any particular reason there's no. they're they're com they're completely unnecessary let's just say what it is right however if your kids still want those things and you want your kids to be like other kids and not feel weird that they have weird food with them uh, maybe you try to put them in single serving packets or maybe you buy them in single serving packets. So it's like, there's a hundred calories. Here's your turkey and cheese sandwich. So we have a nice source of protein. Here's some yogurt, you know, here's uh, a couple pieces of like celery and carrots or whatever, you know, and then they have a, a meal that's start and, and some milk and they have a meal that starts to look like uh, something that has a decent amount of protein in it still satiating and satisfying because yeah. they get some of those other flavors of eating, you know, goldfish or Cheez-Its or whatever. It might be. And they, yeah. And they feel like they're not the odd man out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which I never got, <clears throat> I never got Cheez-Its and I always felt weird and I still, I was still fat. So it's like, 
there's I think there's got to be a healthy balance and and I think accessibility is super key because for a kid kids not going out to the drive through at five years old it's just the kids eating whatever you give it mm -hmm. you yeah. know too much celebrating too i think oh you know we're just going out this one time but it's like well you were out yesterday too and <laughs> two days ago was so-and-so's birthday and the day before that was christmas like you know we're we're celeb like what are we what are we celebrating right and why are we celebrating in such a de destructive way and and why is every celebration about consuming food like why don't we go on a hike as a celebration you yeah. know what i mean like with our day off why isn't it that um yeah, this is the celebrating is out of hand. Out I think of hand. It's it's really interesting how um, and I'll, I'll hear this a lot, especially on uh, parents that are trying to like uh, change their lifestyle and and get healthier themselves. They they won't allow themselves to eat certain things, but they'll still have certain food in the house for the kids. And you'll you'll ask, oh, why is that there? Well, you know, my kid likes to eat that, but if you wouldn't feed that to yourself, then why are you necessarily keeping this here for your child? It's kind of warped. Like you're taking care of that being, you're going to have, let them have these things that even yourself, you, you wouldn't let yourself have a lot of that too. Yeah. It's kind of odd. It is. Yeah. Well, I, I, I remember with babies, with little kids hearing a lot of like, well, you're going to gain weight because you're just going to eat their food and their food is always going to be like pasta and macaroni and cheese and chicken nuggets and stuff. And I, and I was just kind of like, I don't eat that. That's not what I eat. Why would I give that to my kid? Mm -hmm. I did wind up like, I'm not saying I wound up not doing it, but I think you're, I think you're really right. It's like, when I present my kid with a nice salad and a, a baked chicken breast and, and some sweet potato or rice or something like that, they're very happy. They love a nice, healthy meal. Uh, they also like pizza. You know what I mean? And, and it's on me what they eat because they're not getting pizza on their own. Right. And it's just more convenient sometimes for people to you know, give their kids kind of like, you know, they just heat up a frozen pizza. That's true. You know, and it's like, well, they... And you know the other thing with your children though too is like they're not going to starve. You know they're right. they're smart and you know this like I remember my parents saying like that's what's for dinner. You right. Know, it's, and I'm like well, I don't want to eat that. <laughs> and they said all right you're dismissed. You know <laughs> and and then it's like well then you try to go in the kitchen again and they're you you know you don't have other options you know. And so I think that sometimes you do have to take that hard stance. It might not be comfortable but. Um, your kid at seven is not going to know his best uh, dietary options. Right. And he's going to have a lot of impulses and see how his friends uh, react. He's going to see commercials on TV all day long about all these foods. You're going to see these foods everywhere all the time, and they're not going to be able to have any, they're not going to be able to make sensible decisions. Yeah, and, and I think that we turn over responsibility to our children to feed themselves, and it usually begins with stuff like cereal or a microwave pizza or a microwave burrito or something like that that's easy for a younger person to figure out doing. Like, okay, cereal is just pouring stuff in a bowl. Uh, this microwave thing is just pr pressing a few buttons. I don't actually have to let them use knives and turn on fire and stuff like that. And so, and then you couple that with the accessibility and you couple that with the convenience and you couple that with how much celebrating we do. And it's like a recipe for people being overweight mm -hmm. and one convenient hack is to you know just try to have fruits around and like they can go bad and stuff like that but you, you got to just you know hopefully they eat enough of them so it's not a huge problem but if your kid ate like two oranges or something you know it's it's a, a decent amount of food to get through you yeah. know uh if you have options in your fridge that are allowing them to reach for some of these things as snacks i mean they're absolutely delicious i think you were mentioning earlier you said your kids have never turned down like a fruit salad. Never. And who would? Like, who would turn it down? They're amazing. They yeah. taste really good. Throw some cinnamon on there or throw some uh, cream on there or something like that, and it's, uh, it's it's outstanding. Yeah. You put a little lemon on a fruit salad and let it sit for a little bit, it almost creates its own syrup. You know what I mean? It's right. like a oh, canned wow. fruit salad. It's really good. And all you've done is put some acid on it from some lemon. You know what I mean? Like, it's super easy. Those hacks are great. I've done diets where I did I do a little lemon and and and, uh, and even um, cinnamon on a sliced apple and suddenly you've got something that's not quite an apple pie but <laughs> those flavors are there you know what I mean like you can do that and kids will like that I like that 
Mm-hmm. Was uh, learning how to cook was that something that uh, that maybe maybe helped you? Or I don't even know if you did learn how to cook, but you know, learning that you can make uh, healthy options taste good was that part of a process, or did your wife mainly handle the food? No, I mainly handled the food. I I, I went kind of the wrong direction as like a a guy who uh, is a an addict and who wanted to like still have some contact with the thing I had given up when I went on my um, uh, liquid diet almost 20 years ago, 18 years ago, I watched Food Network quite a bit and would try to recreate these meals. So suddenly I was cooking all this stuff like, what do I want to eat today? I want to eat cassoulet with, you know, sausages and beans and and duck fat and all of this. I'm going to make that for my family. I'm not going to eat it, but I'm going to cook it for them. Um, fresh made pasta and all of this. And, and so there was a lot of time that I spent cooking, making stuff taste really good. I now try to not make anything taste too good for myself. And oh. suddenly my family is feeling that burden too, because they'll be like, what's for dinner? And I'll say a chicken breast and rice with no seasoning. And they're like, why are you torturing us? You know what I mean? And I'm, I'm like, this is what I've cooked. I've cooked 20 chicken breasts mm-hmm. and 20 cups of rice and you can have whatever you want. I think from like an evolutionary standpoint, like that's kind of the way that we're meant to eat. And once you start to mix a lot of flavors together, now you're overriding the body's ability to identify like, Hey, you had enough. Yeah. You start to, that's like the Dorito effect, right? You know, you can't stop eating them. You can't only have one type right. of deal. And you don't want your food to be gross by any means. You don't want it to be too bland. But, uh, you know, if you start to mix in a lot of different flavors, then you end up potentially being able to overeat and even overeat on something that's healthy. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Chicken teriyaki. It's a lot easier to eat too much chicken teriyaki than it is to eat chicken and rice with no sauce on it. When you look back at, at, at being a kid, what do you think would have been maybe, other than the education aspect that we talked about, what could have been... Uh, something that I guessed wouldn't have wouldn't have allowed you to gain as much weight as you did. What what do you think an influence or a parent an influence your parents could have had that would have changed that for you? I I want to say like you know both my parents worked and so I think back like if I had been more active with them if we had done more stuff. L- listen, I say that and 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 it's possible that my dad was constantly trying to get me outside to play ball with him. But but I just think that I didn't spend enough time outside mm. actively. And that wasn't important to me. And then growing up, it was never important to me. I didn't have that that feeling of total well-being that I get now when I'm active. Mm. I never remember experience, experiencing that as a kid. So I think if, if I had kind of tapped into that more earlier, and I don't think it works when you're telling a kid, you have to run around the track monotonously mm. for no reason. Just do it because I said to. I think it involves creating a game out mm-hmm. of it somehow. Yeah, they dive for a ball and they're like, oh, playing volleyball ain't half bad. Right. It's kind of cool. And they spend an hour doing it. Yeah. 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 I think it's, um, you know, when it, when, it com- when it comes to parenting, I think uh, we had uh, – a very, very strong power lifter uh, on our podcast at one point. His name is J.P. Price. And J.P. Yeah. weighed like mid-400s or so. And he and he's done a great job losing a lot of weight as well. But he thought a major contributing factor, and I never really heard anybody say this before, but he said exactly what you just said right there. Both his parents worked. And, you know, he he's a believer kind of like in some old-school principles. And he's like, I think having mom at home kind of cooking the meals and kind of, or, or somebody regulating uh, the nutrition he thinks is, is really impactful. And if you, if you look at what has happened in America, there are more, uh, where there are more situations where both parents are out of the house, where both parents are working. Now, you know, we're fortunate where more people are, work, some people are working from home and stuff like that too. Um, but that has to have an impact. Like there's not someone there to really cook the meal the kids at school all day. The kid probably didn't get breakfast. The kid's probably very hungry. Probably ate some junk at school. Um, they're insanely hungry as soon as they come home. And then even if somebody does cook something, the kid barely wants to eat hardly any breakfast because they just they snacked like a madman as soon as they got uh, through the door. They don't eat hardly any breakfast, but they're still or hardly any dinner, and they're still hungry. And then what do they do? They want dessert. Yeah. 
you know, and it just keeps starting the cycle over. So it's like, they're very, um, I don't think people identify this, but they're very like malnourished, even though they could potentially still be overeating. They could potentially be adding body fat, but they still don't have the nutrients necessary to like, to feel satisfied. They certainly don't have the protein. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think all those could be factors. I don't know what the solution is if both parents have to work. So I don't know, you know, that's a, that's a real tricky one, but somebody, I, I know that somebody has got to be taking care of the kids and thinking these things. Mm-hmm. No, yeah. I've heard a lot of, Oh, no, I was just saying, it's just like, what about just something as simple as like an icon meals? Like when I grew up, we had frozen corn dogs in the fridge. That's what I went for. Frozen burritos. Well, it'd be, would have been awesome if there was something like Icon Meals around back when I was a kid to be like, oh, throw an actual meal in the microwave. Like a meal prep company or something. Yeah, like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You ever mess with that or no? I don't know Icon. I know, but do you ever mess with meal prep companies or you still handle all your own stuff? I, I, I've i tried um, I tried meal prep companies. I, tr- I, I tried something, where, but I... But I was doing keto, and I didn't think they, they. This was years ago, and they didn't. They didn't understand those principles. I think they probably know them now. Mm-hmm. But now, I mean, listen. If somebody said we'll hit your macros and your calories exactly, I would do that because mm-hmm. it free up so much of my time. Right. I just haven't. Every time I look, it's like here's your plan, mm-hmm. and you can, and it's roughly. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I don't want roughly. I yeah, want exact. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah. and maybe like. The other hard thing is too, is like most of those companies, they make like snacks and they make like little treats and stuff. And then, I don't know, you just start kind of lowering your, you put your hands down a little bit, you yeah. ease up a little bit. And then next thing you know, you're kind of back to uh, some of your old habits. Yeah. We did that do, um, for my parents, uh, we got them, uh, meal deliveries and it was super helpful for them, but they didn't have, they had zero dietary restrictions. It was just like, they just need food food right. that's made and we mm-hmm. can't go to their house and make it every day so yeah i do find that really interesting though how you purposely you said you purposely make your food really really bland because you know that if it's too good it opens up doors for you yeah. and i think I, I don't think we've talked much about that on the show before like making your food not that tasty but it makes a lot of sense especially if you know that you have an issue with that like with that happening we pretty much just cook very simply and we use salt yeah but right? i think that's tasty as hell yeah yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, so do I. yeah. salt yeah butter, right pepper. I, I use salt i do use salt yeah um but i use salt and i have this excuse that at one point when i was cycling uh some guy was like i see you i know you eat salt give up salt and you'll lose weight and i did but like four days later i collapsed and mm-hmm. then the doctor was mm-hmm. like your sodium levels are shot you need to eat salt you're a big dude you sweat eat salt so I, that's my rationalization for salt but yeah salt is helpful i don't want it to be like work to get through food yeah. i just don't want it to be super comforting gotcha yeah it's salt and if you throw mustard on mustard on something we're having a party yeah that's lots of mustard <laughs> yeah yeah um Ethan, how do you handle social media with your kids? Oh man, they're um, the older kids are adults, so they can do whatever they want with social media. There's a th- there's a restriction on the younger kids' phones, so they get a certain amount of time on social media each day, and then it's and then it's kind of shut off. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's basically how I handle. I wanted to be the guy that didn't let them have social media and. My older kids got phones at like 16, I think. Uh, And I was like, the little kids will not get phones until they're 16. And now, you know, every eight-year-old has a phone. (laughs) And so they all have phones. I Mm -hmm. mean, they didn't get them when they were eight, but, you know, 10. Right. Yeah. How much more difficult would it have been when you were a bigger kid if social media was around? Probably insane. Yeah. I cannot imagine. Because people generally say stuff that they won't say to your face on social media although i do find that people are nicer on instagram than they are on twitter for the most part Mm -hmm. um i don't know why that is social media is weird yeah people are pretty mean on youtube (laughs) too sometimes right really mean (laughs) yeah right because it's they're not there's no picture of them Mm -hmm. connected to it right 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 for yourself is there anything that you uh 
also purposely make a little bit uncomfortable because you said that you kind of like that discomfort of your food. Do you do that in any way with your workouts or anything else you do? I like suffering a little bit. I huh. find that anything, the end of suffering is usually more rewarding than the end of be just being comfortable. Um, now, I mean, I say that and then you could look at like the difference between a first class seat and a coach seat going to Europe and like, no, I feel better at the end of that flight. When right. I've but you slept. did, but you made yourself uncomfortable to get the first class seat. Right. right? Exactly. Yeah. So that I think w w there's some, there's some effect to suffering that I think is beneficial when you, when you have to work hard and, and push yourself past comfort. And if that's with food or an, a workout, you know, like what we did at the end of uh, the workout where it's like, I'm uncomfortable. I'm not going to do this anymore. Okay, can I? Yes, I can. That is more beneficial to me than having quit at the point just before discomfort. Yeah. I think workout-wise, like, what I always think in my head is, like, I worked really hard to get to this spot right here. These next few sets are going to suck, but, you know, put your chin strap on or your seatbelt on and kind of get ready for a, a rough one. Like, it's going to be hard, but... You spent the last maybe 20, 30 minutes warming up. Uh, maybe you drove to a coffee shop or maybe you had a pre-workout. You've been thinking about the workout a little bit the night before. You know, there's a lot of things that have to happen and fall into place. You know, I drop my kids off at school and then I get here. It's like I, I did all these other things. I set up everything good. I had a good meal last night. Everything's ready to go. And then when you get to that point, where you're kind of a little bitchy and you're like, oh, my elbow hurts or shoulder hurts or this hurts or that hurts. You know, you got to kind of shake that out. I mean, I'll literally sometimes when I get underneath the squat, I'll, you know, sh move my head around rapidly, like shake it, shake it out, <laughs> like boom, shake out the self doubt and wake the fuck up and let's push into this. Cause this is, this is the moment that can uh, really help you improve, you know, and to some extent maybe help you know, I have maybe some weird views on it, but like to separate you out from the rest, to set you out from the pack. Um, I Somebody that uh, recently on our podcast, Ron Partlow, he said, you know, to uh, to lead an orchestra, you got to turn your back on the crowd. And I was like, whoa, I was like, I like that. Yeah. You know, that sounds really cool. But in order to be a leader, in order to be kind of like, you know, out in front, showing people the way that uh, you believe it, it is the way, that's what you got to do. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. I love that thing about the uh, turning your back on the orchestra because nothing sounds more uncomfortable than that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. You know? It's a great visual. Awesome. Andrew, close it out for us, buddy. I, I was looking for the, uh, the video of you shaking out your head. This actually did catch my attention. I've never seen you shake it this hard mm -hmm. right here. Shake it like a Polaroid picture. Oh, I moved over. Sorry. Anyways, why don't you shave your chest, Mark? It's so nasty. I know oh. a lot of a lot of dudes want me to <laughs> shave my chest. Maybe I can have Ethan help me out with that. I uh, I tr I listen as a an aspiring fitness model. I did shave my chest once. My wife was furious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can really create a lot of friction if you can picture what we're talking about. Yeah. Is it, uh, was it this one? No, it's the next one. Anyways, it comes up eventually. Yeah, yeah, it's the next one. Got it. Yeah, I just wanted to show Ethan what right here. There Ooh. you go. Yeah. A little, little head shake. Yeah. 505, not bad. It's awesome. Yeah, not bad for being, for uh, grizzling myself up so many, so many years. Yeah. Um, real, real quick, um, this is actually exciting to tell Ethan about it, but um, shout out to Piedmontese Beef. So you right now being on a lower fat, higher higher carb higher protein um, i'm sure you're like okay i could eat fish i could eat chicken i would like a fatty cut of steak but it doesn't fit the macros so piedmontese beef is actually higher protein lower fat really so my favorite cut is the flat iron steak it's Not the type of cattle that they have yeah they're very lean Great. So, so 90 grams of protein eight grams of fat for the whole cut wow i know dude, it's <laughs> we'll get some sent down to you yeah, that like that a won't pound be... that's like a pound so of that meat. So no, that one is is a little bit smaller. It's um like I think well, that's only like an eight ounce cut right there. Wow, but ninety grams of protein, in dude. Eight yeah, ounces? this uh this like flat iron steak that they have, it cooks up in like four or five minutes, and it's it's all protein and it 
and uh, it tastes awesome. That sounds incredible. Yeah. It's like a, almost like a thinly cut New York strip without any of the fat mm-hmm. on there. Right. It's so good. Do, it's they, so good. do, do they do a ground beef? They do a ground yeah. beef, but I think they just do a traditional like eighty five fifteen. Yeah. But like in they have a like, leaner, they have a leaner uh, ground beef okay. as well that ta- that taste for some weird like. Mm-hmm. When I first started buying, I mean, this is like they they support the podcast, so mm-hmm. we're going to promote the hell out of them. But when I first bought their uh, like ninety six or whatever beef that that they have, um, I was like, this is going to, you know, this is going to taste like crap. But I already bought some of their other stuff that was very lean, and it didn't taste like crap. It tasted awesome. And when I cooked up their ground beef, I was like, I, okay, maybe they're just, you know, maybe they're fucking lying about the stats. I don't know yeah. what's going on here, but they're certainly not. It's, it, they have, they have just really, really good products. Um, and again, it's the type of cattle that they have. If you go on their website and you check out some of the stuff, the cows are, are jacked and tan. They look like bodybuilders. I got to check this out. I do, I do, I do eat beef, but very rarely now. And I miss it quite a bit. Mm. Got it. Um, I was trying to find the name. It's a blue uh, something, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, it's the one. So I don't know if you've ever watched uh, Bigger, Stronger, Faster, Chris Bell's documentary. So he's next to one of those gigantic Belgian cows. blue, cow. Belgian blue. Oh there yes, it where it's yoked. Yeah. yeah. So that's it's. Uh, that's, They're similar to those. Cows. Yes, right. but they that's the visual. You know, that's what it looks like. And like in Sema, like the uh, the ribeyes have like I mean half the amount of fat. Also, yeah, it's like a half the amount of fat that a typical ribeye would have. Wow. So like you can definitely fit those into your lower fat. Yeah. Like, a lot of bodybuilders use that because they tend to have to eat lower fat too. So yeah. it's good stuff. Even their filet, it's going to be super it's tender so and it's, you know, it's still going to taste really good, but have about half the amount of fat. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if that's it, exciting. yeah. And if you're experienced, like you'll look at this cut of meat and you'll be like, that's going to taste like a shoe. And it, it just, they're more tender. They're, they're insane. Okay. Yeah. Um, and also they have a jacked in tan pack and a, uh, a power project deluxe bundle. Mm. Yeah, and our promo code works on both of those. So head over to Piedmontese.com. That's P-I-E-D-M-O-N-T-E-S-E.com. At checkout, enter promo code POWERPROJECT for 25% off your order. And if your order is $99 or more, you get free two-day shipping. Highly recommend it, dude. We're, we're going to get you some, but okay, it's, good. it's insane. I'm going to eat it. Yeah, dude. It's, it's oh, Dude, for your low fat right now. I'm excited. It's a huge treat for yeah. sure. Yeah. Guys, make sure you check out the other episode that we did with Ethan. It's an honor to have you here. This is absolutely outstanding. It was fun to get that workout in yeah. uh, today as well. And thank you for being so open and sharing so much. I know it's not always easy to talk about uh, you know, the different struggles and different issues you've had, but I think that this is going to be monumental and this is going to help thousands of people. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I, this, this has been awesome. What a great day. Where can people find you? Uh, Ethan Suplee on Instagram and Twitter and the American Glutton podcast. And Seema? And Seema Yin on Instagram and YouTube and Seema Yin Yang on TikTok and Twitter. Andrew, did you tell us where you're at? Not yet, but at I am Andrew Z on Instagram, and please make sure you're following the podcast at Mark Bell's Power Project. Mark, where are you at? At Mark Smilly Bell. Today is day number 34, I think, or maybe 35, of uh, World Carnivore Month. Uh, I extended it out to just do 100 days of carnivore, so that's why it's extended out beyond the month. And uh, feeling good, feeling strong, feeling amazing with it. Uh, Ethan was asking me today if I, you know, feel any dip in, in energy or anything like that. I certainly don't. I feel awesome. I feel really good. Uh, we've talked about on the show before. It's kind of hard to quantify that. It's like a very general thing. Um, but for me and for the moment, it's working amazing. I recently brought in more dairy. I recently got rid of fasting and they're not because uh, fasting wasn't working for me. It was great. Uh, I just wanted to switch things up. And the weird thing is I'm, I'm eating um, I feel like I'm eating more, but it, I could potentially not be eating more, but I, I with bringing in dairy and with <clears throat> not fasting, um, it only has made like a couple of pounds difference in my body weight. So mm-hmm. it felt like before with fasting, it felt like, um, it was, you know, it wasn't always easy to make it through every day to do 18 or 20 hours of fasting. And I s- so far have been a similar body weight. So I'm kind of interested to kind of see. I'm going to keep pushing it. I'm going to try to eat more. And I think I might even just see if I can like bulk doing this wow. diet. I don't even know if I can, cause it's like hard to eat that much meat, but, yeah. uh, a lot of meat, a lot of eggs and uh, feeling amazing. I'm at Mark's Millie Bell. Strength is never weakness. Weakness, never strength. Catch you all later.